well, thank you all for coming. This is the first time we've ever done a recording, a podcast. Uh, so it's a, a bit experimental in that way. <coughs> um, th this evening's speak speaker is probably familiar to almost all of you in this room. Um, he kindly provided me with his curriculum vitae, and I'll go very quickly through that. He was a public servant from 1957 to 1975 in the Ministry of Works and in Housing. And then he was Assistant General Secretary of the Public Service Association. In 1978, he was elected MP for Dunedin North. And that was followed by a, a 12-year 12, a 12 parliamentary career, which included holding six ministerial portfolios. Um, at various times, he was Minister of Labour, Minister of State Services, Minister of Immigration, Minister of State-Owned Enterprises, and Minister of Railways. Not all at once, I don't think, but yes. uh, all at once. For 15 months I was. Yes. Uh, um, I, I, and he was deputy, deputy also at one point for some time, I guess, Deputy Minister of Finance. When he retired from Parliament in 1990, he joined the staff of the university for a five-year stint in the administration. First of all, in the Faculty of Dentistry for two years, and then as Secretary to the Division of Health Sciences at the Faculty of Medicine for three years. And then from 1995 to 98, he was the Chair of the Southern Regional Health Authority. Since that time, he's been prominent in committee work and on, on working parties, committees, and boards in the government sector, the for-profit sector, and the non and the non-profit sector, both locally and nationally. Others who heard him speak before said that this talk is not one to miss if you're interested in the New Zealand history of health and social welfare. So it's my pleasure to welcome him to the first one to uh, be recorded as we go along. So I hope the recording uh, goes well. Please save your questions till the end and then uh, it makes it easier for the, uh, uh, for the podcast to be put together nicely. So, it's my stand, the three wise, wise men of the valley. Well, Mr. Chairman, and uh, may I say what a pleasure it is for me to give this speech again. Uh, I was very happy to accept the invitation because it didn't involve a great deal of work because I had already delivered it uh, at a function for the Friends of the Hocken some time ago. Our journey tonight begins in Kurau, the small township in the Waitaki Valley. The 2013 census informs us that its current population is 312. But I wish to take in the early 1930s when its base population was much higher than today and was uh, augmented by those living in the construction village six kilometres away. The construction workforce peaked at 1,230. These people were there for the construction of the Waitaki Dam. The construction of the project commenced in mid-1928 and the scheme was opened in 1934. Most of the heavy work was done by pick and shovel. The power station was designed to produce 30 megawatts of electricity, which provided for about half of the South Island's needs. 
This indicates how small the economy was then, exacerbated, of course, by the effects of the Great Depression. Today, the Waitaki River power stations run by Meridian Energy and Genesis Energy operate power stations with a combined capacity of 1,538 megawatts. Much of this electricity is transmitted to the North Island. 30 megawatts in the original scheme, over the, all of the schemes in the Waitaki today, 1,538. The scheme took Waitaki into and through the, de at the depths of the depression. When work was scarce and pay, compared with living costs, was lower than it had been in the 1920s. This put great strain on the ability of families to manage their money. In addition, many otherwise unemployed men, with neither any training in hard physical work, nor any liking for it, took jobs at Waitaki and found the going exceedingly tough. This was exacerbated by a climate which was windy and in winter bitterly cold, especially before tents were replaced by wooden huts and small houses. It was probably the chilling wind that made working conditions at Waitaki worse than other dams and irrigation channels being constructed in, in central Otago about the same time. Into this dynamic mix of rural township and large construction camp, there were three dynamic individuals. The Reverend A.H., known to most as Arnold, or better still, Nordy, Nordmeyer, Mr. A.M. Andy Davidson, and Dr. D.G. Gervin McMillan. The first of the trio to arrive in Kura was Arnold Henry Nordmeyer, known, as I said, to almost everybody as Nordy. Nordy was born in Dunedin as Heinrich Arnold Nordmeyer in 1901. His father was a German seaman and his mother an Irish widow from County Tyrone. He was educated at Waitaki Boys High School and the University of Otago, where he graduated with a BA and a Diploma in Social Science. He then studied at Knox College and was ordained a Presbyterian minister in 1925. He was appointed minister to the Kurau Presbyterian Church in 1925 and served in that role until 1935 when he resigned to contest the Omaru electorate on behalf of the Labour Party. He joined the Labour Party in 1932. He was successful at the election and held the seat until 1949. He was re-elected to Parliament as the MP for Island Bay in 1951. That was on the death of Peter Fraser. He was a Cabinet Minister from 41 until 1949 and was Minister of Finance from 57 until 1960. He was the leader of the opposition from 1963 until 1965, and I might interpolate here that he was my parliamentary leader on the first occasion I contested a parliamentary seat at the grand old age of 23 in central Otago. He retired from Parliament, Arnold Nordmeyer that is, in 1969 and died in 1989. Incidentally, all three of these wise old men were graduates from the University of Otago. In 1927, Andy Davidson was appointed headmaster at Kura School. The school was shortly afterwards upgraded to a district high school. He was born in Mornington, Dunedin. When he was eight years old, his father died, and in spite of great hardships, his mother insisted upon ob his obtaining a good education. He attended Otago Boys High School, and was subsequently enrolled in the Teachers College in the University of Otago. After the completion of the dam, Andy Davidson was appointed in 1935 to the position of headmaster of the McAndrew Road School, and in 1940, after graduating BA in 1937, MA in 39, and Diploma in Education in 40, was appointed 
head of the McAndrew Intermediate School. He retired from teaching in 1954 and died in 1982. David Gervin Macmillan was born in New Plymouth in 1904. His parents were dairy farmers. He was Ducks of Stratford Technical High School in 1921 and gained a Taranaki scholarship in 1922, which assisted in funding his costs in studying for medicine at the University of Otago. He graduated MBCHB in 1929. In 1929, he and Ethel Emma Black were married. Now, you might recall the name of Ethel Emma Macmillan, who, of course, subsequently became the member for Dunedin North in a by-election in '53, I think. In 1928, with the Waitaki Dam under active construction, the Public Works Department established the Waitaki Hydro Medical Association, to provide general medical services for the workforce and their families. The subscription was four shillings and threepence, 42 cents in today's money, a month. The doctor was to receive 60% of the association's income. Dr. Watt, the Kurau doctor, was first involved in the scheme. In February 1929, he left on long leave and was replaced by Dr. McMillan first as a locum, and he later bought the practice. He joined the Labour Party Kurau branch in 1931, but had been associated with the party since 1923. He was a very busy and conscientious doctor and was noted to be one of the hardest working in New Zealand. It is said that he had a motor car and used to drive up these roads and there were there were trains that would go backwards and forwards carrying uh, material for the dams. And sometimes the train would be heading towards the crossing the road and he would be going on his car and he wouldn't give way for the train. Toot vigorously and expected it to stop. Uh, it didn't, but he didn't get cleaned up in that. But anyway, as the number of workers increased, so too did Dr. McMillan's income. Some criticism resulted. It was alleged that revised funding arrangement between the association and the doctor entitled him to receive over £2,000, $4,000 a year, well above the $1,600 salary of the Director General of Health. With the running down of the dam project workforce, Dr McMillan was faced with a shrinking practice. So at the end of 1934, he bought a house with a practice detached here in Dunedin. In 1935, Macmillan entered Parliament as the MP for Dunedin West, defeating William Downey Stewart, the then Minister of Finance. In Parliament, he took an active role in the introduction of public health and social security form, uh, reforms, which I will describe later. He was appointed a minister in 1940, and I will go into how he was appointed if you're in any way interested at question time. He was given the portfolios of marine, prisons, and science and industrial research. He loathed the portfolios. He had expected that he would have been appointed minister of health. He resigned his portfolios in 1941 and did not contest the 1943 general election. He returned full-time to Dunedin and developed a busy medical practice here. I remember he was our family doctor, uh, but he was sort of the family doctor, it seemed, for about half of Dunedin. I mean, he set up a group practice, Cotton, uh, Jenkins, uh, or some of other names will be known to but were in that uh, group practice that he had here. I can remember as a little kid going in, and they had the system where the nurse put your car record along the top of the counter in front of her and uh, it seemed to me a very high counter but I was probably just a little kid uh, well I was a little kid and a, a doctor would come out of one of the rooms and just pick up the next one and call your name and call you in um, and you might have got Dr McMillan but you might not have 
you could easily have got some of the others. He was elected to the Dunedin City Council and the Otago, Hos uh, and the Otago Hospital Board, of which for a time he was chair. He died in 1951, aged 46. He uh, had uh, heart, congestive heart failure, and in those days not a great deal could be done for people with that condition. He was clearly a workaholic. The Macmillans Mac lived in a permanent home in Kura village, which still exists today. Got a name tag if you go into the, some of the side streets, if you're going into Kura, you turn left into some of the side streets and you'll find quite a substantial home. It was at this home that Gervin Macmillan, Arnold Nordmeyer, and Andy Davidson met regularly to discuss solutions to the massive social problems confronting New Zealanders. It was while the project was being constructed that unemployment in New Zealand reached an estimated peak of 100,000. And that is a terrible number when you realise that the total population at the time was 1.5 million. Dr. Macmillan was the most productive politically of the three. In 1933, he wrote a pamphlet on the right-wing New Zealand Legion comparing it to the Ku Klux Klan. I recall Andy Davidson telling me that the trio drafted a circular advocating the introduction of guaranteed price for milk. Uh, he ran copies off in the school Justetna and the pamphlets were placed under the milk, uh, under the lids of the milk cans um, that uh, the farmers took to the road's edge by horse-drawn sledges for collection to be taken to the dairy factory. They seldom met the farmers. The most influential material produced by Dr. Macmillan is his pamphlet issued in 1934 advocating, and I've got a copy, autographed to a dear Mr. Swift, I think it is, uh, a rare thing, is his son Malcolm, uh, whom I worked with for a little while, had never seen it until I was able to produce a, uh, photocopies for him. It was, a, it was a print, uh, issued in 1934 advocating the introduction of a free, universal and comprehensive national health service titled A National Health Service New Zealand of tomorrow. The tightly typed 12-page pamphlet, which cost tuppence, covered an extraordinarily wide range of health-related topics. Dr. Macmillan advocated for a free national health service and that it should be complete. Prevention was to be the priority, including good housing, a healthy environment and balanced diet. He also said that there must be a provision of income to replace that loss to unemployment, sickness, old age and death. The health service should provide all facilities for diagnosis and treatment of disease. There were to be, quote, complete, to be complete and include medical, dental, pharmaceutical, specialist and institutional treatment as well as all the ancillary aids, close quote. It must, he wrote, be based upon the principle of the provision of a family doctor for every person. The pamphlet also covered diverse issues, such as the health needs of school children, medical education, nurse training, food and balanced diet, the need for good housing, a scientific a scientific study of crime and the call for a more systematic, more sy sympathetic understanding of those who were imprisoned. Factory conditions and industrial diseases and a public health system working towards the prevention of disease. This in 14 pages, most extraordinarily comprehensive document. The general election of 1935 was held on the 27th of November. Labour swept into office. The new government was sworn in on 6 December 1935. Dr Macmillan and the Reverend Arnold Nordmeyer were, as I've said to you, elected Members of Parliament. 
Some people still speak of and recall fondly that the new government approved a Christmas bonus for, for those on benefits, for uh, the unemployment benefit to be paid out prior to Christmas. The public servants must have been rushing at that time with the government elect, uh, sworn in only early in December. But anyway, something that people talked about for decades to come. To state policy is one thing, to implement it another. As a first step to introducing these policies, a committee of Labour members of Parliament under the chairmanship of Dr Macmillan was set up, which brought down recommendations for action. His committee report was presented publicly in September 1937, having been considered and endorsed by the Labour caucus earlier. Now you understand that a caucus is, is of one party, it's all the MPs of that party meeting uh, um, with themselves, not with other parties. During the deliberations of the committee, Macmillan was engaged in a New Zealand-wide dialogue and debate with the New Zealand branch of the British Medical Association. Much of the ill will to the proposed changes to medical services came from the chair of the NZBMA's National Health Insurance Committee, Dr James Jameson. In March 1938, the government set up a parliamentary select committee, which is a body of comprising representatives from all parties, but with a majority from the government, of 11 members of parliament, that's a big committee, to examine its proposals to establish a national health and superannuation scheme. This committee was chaired by Nordmeyer. The government's proposed proposals followed closely the Macmillan recommendations. The proposals were, one, to establish a national health service for the purposes of ensuring to all persons adequate, adequate medical, surgical, pharmaceutical, dental, hospital, nursing or other treatment necessary to maintain sound physical and mental health. And two, to establish a national superannuation service, whereby provision shall be made that all persons resident in New Zealand shall be assured of an adequate income to maintain them in reasonable comfort when they become unable to support themselves by reason of old age, infirmity or other disability or on account of widowhood. And three, to provide a universal general practitioner free, uh, uh, service free to all members of the community requiring medical attention. Free hospital or sanatorium treatment for all free mental health care and treatment for all, free medicines, free maternity treatment, including the cost of maintenance in the maternity home. All proposed for the, in, also proposed for introduction finances, when finances were available were the following services. Anaesthetic, laboratory and consultant, massage and physiotherapy, transport service to and from hospital, dental benefit, optical benefit. So it's interesting, isn't it, that we have still got a wee way to go before the vision of, more especially, Dr Macmillan <coughs> is, is uh, introduced. This reform pa package was reported on to Parliament and passed into law. One mighty policy row concerning the delivery of general practitioner service broke out within the government and between the government and the BMA. Macmillan, Nordmeyer and Nash, and Nash was the Minister of Finance, who was extremely supportive of all these proposals as they moved through the decision-making process. They all were desperately keen for GPs to be employed by the state. The BMA fought this tenaciously. Finally, Fraser, as Minister of Health, who got on moderately well with his fellow Scot, Dr Jameson, settled on a generous fee of seven and sixpence, 75 cents, for each time a service was provided by a doctor. Some within the Labour Party never forgave Fraser for this backdown. 75 cents uh, vis a visit 
uh, compared with an hourly rate for a tradesman of 20 to 25 cents and an old age pension of $2.25 a week. So it will be seen as quite a significant uh, uh, payment towards general practitioners. And the material that I have indicates that there were a number of GPs practices that were very stressed as a consequence of non-payment of fees uh, during the Depression years. And many a practice was saved as a consequence of seven and sixpence a visit uh, by their patients. The hugely expanded health and welfare programs, it was decided, would be funded by a dedicated social security charge of a shilling in the pound of income. This charge was increased to one and sixpence in the pound in 1946. The 1938 general election was contested in part on the issue, if you want these programs, vote Labour. The Labour government was re-elected with an increased majority and so the comprehensive welfare state as we know it became a reality commencing on the 1st of April 1939. You might recall that the leader of the opposition described these schemes, no, you won't recall it, nobody does, I just recall having read about it, uh, as applied lunacy, and Savage described it as applied Christianity. Uh, sort of a powerful punchline, I think, at the time. Now, there's just one sort of a downer on all of this that I ought to share with you in relative to Dr. Macmillan. You might recall that there was some controversy about his fees when he was in the, associate, the Health Association in Cura <coughs> and how he fought vigorously to have a salaried service for, gen, uh, for general practitioners and other medica, medical personnel. But when he returned to Dunedin, he obviously decided, well, the system rewarded him by seven and sixpence a time, and so he would take it. And in 1942, McMoon, uh, I don't know whether he was Minister of Health or quite what he was, but it, or it might have been social, Minister for Social Security, wrote to Walter Nash as Minister of Finance and, and said that Macmillan was about the greatest Social Security beneficiary in the Dominion. <laughs> I can remember him knocking on the door and he, uh, of our home in Kaika Valley Road and he was intended to go to the house next door and my mother came in and said, Oh, Dr Macmillan, so nice to see you. Oh, but you're not scheduled to be here. I mean, he used to come and see my grandmother and things like that. And how is she? Oh, she says, fine, fine. Oh, would you just sign this docket? <laughs> so my mother signed it and he walked down the path and walked in the house next door. Um, but anyway, um, then we find in January 1947, Nash was advised that Macmillan had received a very large sum of £13,800 in social security payments in the year. Now, it had always seemed to me a lot of money when your head of the Department of Health would have been on about 2000 So I fed that number in the other day into the Reserve Bank's uh, inflation index. Quite a handy thing to do. You can feed old numbers in and up it comes. And that sum of money, 13800 and 2015 dollars is 999,842 dollars. Now, is it any wonder that when the King's royal tour was postponed, you might recall he got cancer and they took ribs out immediately after the war, the government in preparation had imported, and we were very scarce of overseas funds at the time, had imported two very remarkable cars, Landau's. And one of them had a fold down back and it was intended that uh, His Majesty the King would have stood in this space and waved to the adoring crowd. Well, he, he, he had to postpone the tour through ill health, so the government laid, loaded down with these two flaming expensive vehicles. What they do? Put them out to tender. Who tendered for them? One of them anyway, Macmillan. And I can still remember him driving around the streets of the city 
and this great ornate black vehicle. He wasn't standing in the back waving or anything, he was actually driving, but an extraordinary thing. And I recall this the last time I gave this talk when uh, Dr. McMillan's son Malcolm and his wife, now deceased, and children were present in the audience and I said, I'm right, aren't I, Malcolm, that your father purchased a Landau. He said, oh, you start of a bad family team because he got a lot of old cars, Malcolm. I said, what happened to it? He said, it's in Tonga. So the king of Tonga might be riding around, I don't know. But there we are. Well, Mr Chairman, I've attempted tonight to highlight how three committed, highly intelligent Christian socialists were instrumental in bringing into being programs that continue to make New Zealand a caring and supportive society. Thank you very much. If you have questions, uh, please go ahead now. Uh, and Stan will repeat the question so that it gets on to the podcast. Yes. More by way of a comment and a question, some of the more senior members of the audience may recall that you were ridiculed in a tapping concert many years ago in which you were described as Dr. McMillian. <laughs> this was in the 1940s, I would say. And he, uh, in fact, um, was going to take, take the association to court over this Mm. Rather nasty slur on his <laughs> on, on, on the doctor's concern, and in fact, in the tapping, I can record it just quite clearly. They had a whole lot of people who were in pens, like a um, like a, 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 like in a farm, and uh, who somebody move the gate this way, pills, injections, whatever, as the as the student went through. <laughs> I don't know if you heard the observation. It was a, a, a capping concert post-war where Dr. McMillan was described as Dr. McMillian. Um, when Ethel Emma McMillan passed away and she died in 81... Uh, no, sorry, 84. And... Uh, she lived, and I don't know whether the house they had was the house on, it was on Highgate, just by the overbridge. Oh. It's gone now. And they never dared touch it while she lived because she was a city councillor and a fearsome uh, lady. Uh, and they waited till time uh, enabled them to pull the house down. But I suspect that's where they, uh, Macmillan purchased the house and had the practice there, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, but anyway, when she passed away, uh, I saw a, a, an auction one day and a, pay, uh, and a, a notice said uh, the art collection of uh, Ethel M. Millen was going to be sold the next week. And I thought, oh God, I didn't know she had an art collection. But I suppose uh, even with death duties, she would have probably been in a fairly comfortable position uh, as a consequence of uh, the, the endeavours of her late husband. A shilling in the pound and then one and six in the pound as a dedicated kind of health tax, when was that abandoned and the whole health budget just became part mm. of the general pot? It's a very good question. I think it was... Could you repeat it? Could you yes, repeat the, question? the question is when was the, the, the dedicated tax, a shilling initially, one and six months later, actually abandoned and that health and uh, health costs are now just borne by the general exchequer. I had at the back of my mind that it was uh, Robert Muldoon that did it, but I might be wrong in that. Uh, it would have cost some money to run a dedicated fund, uh, as you would expect, <clears throat> but it did have the effect of ensuring that the money that was coming in was assigned explicitly to health and, and uh, health and related programs. Yeah, it ran for a long time. The real thing is, it would have been the early 1950s because I can remember having to pay one and six in the pound. Right. And then it stopped at a certain point. Fifties. 
Ah, uh, well, I'm corrected, it's the 50s. The, um, the story you uh, told of the introduction of the health service in 1939 has remarkable similarities with the introduction of the British National Health in yeah. 1948, particularly the difficulty with the British Medical Association yes. and the opposition of GPs. Yes. I wonder, did and you're in Bevan or the British Labour Party have any contact with the New Zealand Labour Party to kind of learn from their experiences in, in, in introducing the British National What influence did New Zealand have on that? The question is, what influence did the New Zealand scheme have upon the introduction by the Attlee government, uh, Minister of Health Nye Bevan, on the introduction of the National Health Service in Britain? Now, I'm assisted in my reply by an observation made to me by Gordon Parry, recently deceased, who got a, a um, fellowship to go to Britain immediately after the war and was enabled to interview all sorts of people, including Attlee, Bevan, and, and a range of very interesting people. And Bevan was highly critical of the per-event reward for the medical practitioners and said they will become millionaires uh, and milk the system and are doing so. So, I mean, he was certainly mindful of that. And, and we're standing firm in respect of that element in the, in the British system. Don't know much more about it, but there we are. So he's obviously looking at it. Mr. Roger, there's another side to that. Um, it's, it's well known and certainly recorded in the good biography of Atlee that Nye Bevan, contesting the, uh, the charge with the, fact, with the BMA, said uh, to resolve it, I will stuff their mouths with gold. It was the only way he could get them in line. And Alan <laughs> Bennett has picked this up and in a very delightful little film called The Private Function. He has a standard GP of the time reiterating this. No, a GP with gold teeth. Uh, the <laughs> the so Atlee's memoirs, uh, no. Atlee's biography are quite interesting. His, the way he conducted his affairs relative to his ministers was intriguing. He hand-wrote memoranda to them, and the letterbook copies are still in existence. And ar around about that time, he was writing to Nye Bevan, saying, you know, you better put, you, you, you're doing splendidly. I mean, it's a great job, and it's a tough job, but some of the rhetoric relative to the BMA might, I think we'll talk of shroud waving and bits and pieces. Uh, it might be wise for you to pull back from that. Uh, but only Bevan is the recipient of that epistle and, and Attlee knew of it. I mean, it was ne ne that, was all, 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 that was the style of his uh, communication with ministers, which I found was really rather interesting. Hmm. Alongside that desire to maintain economic efficiency of the health service, there was a desire also to maintain the independence of the profession, of the medical profession. So there was a tension between mm. you know, a cheaper mm. salaried service mm. and an independent mm. profession. And my own view is that I'm glad that... The that Jameson and won and Fraser, Fraser recognised that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. It might not have survived. Oh, the, the observation was that there were some efficiency gains in allowing a degree of independence to medical practitioners rather than putting in a salaried service which might be more efficient in financial terms, in the short run at any rate. Uh, I suspect it would have become a burning long-term political issue which would probably have been revisited at some time and upended. Although in Britain it hasn't, but, uh, uh, the, the core of the National Health Service seems to have been preserved there, but I suspect in a small society like ours there could have been changes.
and had to be ordered back to work by the Court of Criminal Defence just as the prelims of the High Court. Wow. Well, the observation was that in Saskatchewan, the, the doctors went on strike and had to be directed back by high court order. Uh, I, I, I recall reading on one occasion that the doctors in Israel went on strike on one occasion. I don't know why, what it was about. And there was no recorded deaths on the day that it occurred. So the newspaper. <laughs> but whether there was a, the reason for that was people were too scared to die, <laughs> or whether there was a bit of a delay in recording the, the, this notable family event uh, such that they never got into the newspapers for a day or two later. I don't know, but I, it did cause some amusement by commentators at the time. Well, no, I don't see anybody, any other questions, comments. Uh, I've got to ask uh, a beautiful presentation uh, that tells a major, actually, there's a major social and political move mm. that took place. Mm. But what, one of the things that interested me is just, yes, the Dr. McMillian bit from the, it just wasn't quite so squeaky clean <laughs> as, uh, as, one, as one might have thought. But that's the way the human race is. I have observed over the many years that there are, it's not unusual for l some left-wingers mm. to be very keen to stuff their mattresses with notes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That's a, a wonderful talk.